Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In today's episode, I want to tackle a topic I've talked about a lot of times on the podcast, practice variability, and touch on a new article that addresses some common issues, you know, things that have been brought up lately. So if you think about the classic practice variability research, right, it's it's one of extremes. We compare uh, essentially no variability in practice, block practice with tons of variability, random practice. And in general, we find the random is better, but the results are quite inconsistent, right? And there's been a lot of people speculating about why this might be the case. And anyone that's worked in an applied setting, you know, you realize you can't just throw unlimited variability at someone in practice. So that's what this article is trying to do. This article called Applying Different Levels of Practice Variability for Motor Learning, More is Not Better. This article recently published in the journal Peer J, so that which means uh, open access. So you, if you follow the link in the show notes, you can you can get access to this article. So the question they're after, as I mentioned, there's some inconsistent results of this, right? The common theme that's come across is that we may need to vary the level of variability we present to a new learner um, to get optimal learning effects, depending on a possible of a variety of things, their skill level, their own inherent variability, how inconsistent or consistent they are, right? There might be an optimal measure, measure of variability that we need to use that's not too high or too low. So kind of a Goldilocks effect. And as I mentioned, anyone that actually works in applied setting, you know, yeah, I learned this in, in my applied work I do. You know, I don't just go on a baseball field and throw a million different pitches with random variations in speed at a batter, a new bat, a young batter. They would be not learn anything. It'd be way too difficult. We have to adjust the conditions, right? So the idea is there might be some sort of U-shape relationship between the amount of variability and the learning effects that we get, where there's going to be some optimal level of a moderate amount of variability, not too high, not too low, you know, that we could also tie into the, the idea of the challenge point hypothesis that because very you know another way to think of variability, right? Variability is a way to challenge an athlete. It makes the task more difficult. It's one of the easier ways to vary the uh, difficulty of a task, I find, right? If you're having someone, you know, hit with different bat weights, how often you switch bats is going to change the difficulty. You get more or less variability. You're changing the variability there. Right. So so this is the idea they want to test in this paper. Do a formal test instead of just comparing extremes, block, no variability, random, high variability. Let's look at the relationship between the amount of variability and the amount of learning you get and also based on how where you start. OK, so they're looking at whether the amount of so they're looking at novice participants. They're using a throwing task. So whether people are complete novices or not is questionable. Right. Most people have thrown something before. Um, they're they're expecting this U-shaped relationship where best learning was going to occur for a moderate amount of variability, not too high, too low. Okay, um, too low of variability, essentially constant or block practice is going to get not have learning effects, uh, not be enough variations to show learning effects. Too high is going to cause chaos and not you know, benefits. Right. So that's really what they want to test in the study. Uh, a kind of fairly fairly basic idea, but an important one. So the task, as I mentioned, they used a throwing task where you had to pick up an object, a ball, and throw it to a target on a wall, right? The target was at a certain height and distance from you, 1.65 meters from you and two meters above the ground, okay? Um, they, uh, they're they're going to vary the, the where the target is. That's how they're going to create variability of practice, right? Importantly, and I'm going to get to this at the end, this is an issue that I'm going to have with this paper. In the pre-test and the post-test, you're throwing at the target in the same location. So they're measuring your performance at throwing at that tar one target location at 1.6 meters from you and two meters from. What they're going to vary is how you practice, okay, how you train for that, this pre and post-test, okay? So all participants are going to do the pre-test. Um, they do two weeks of training and then do re retests up to a month later, okay? Um, they do 20 throws each, okay? And after the pretest, what they did was, was they, did, they put people into different groups um, depending on their performance, right? So how much they, how accurate they were with their throws before, they kind of tried to vary the, the variability based on your performance, okay? And they had four groups. They had a control group that did no training, which we'll see in a second. 
But then they had four different variability groups. So the variability constant grading group, they essentially practice the pre and post test. They throw to the same exact target over and over and over. So strict repetition. Okay. So in, that's called constant practice in the lingo. Then they had a low vary group where there was a small amount. I'm going to show you a visual representation of this in a second. A small dispersion in the, the target. So the targets were at different locations on the wall that you were throwing to. Uh, they're spread by uh, about 0 to 20 centimeters. Um, in the low variable, moderate variable, variability group, there's 0 to 40 centimeters. And high variability group, there's 0 to 60 centimeters. So we're having lots of targets spread out that you have to throw the ball to. Just how much you spread them is what they're varying. So here's a visual representation. Um, on the left, we have the constant group. You're throwing the exact same target every time. Um, then you have more. The numbers represent uh, the trial. So one, two, three. So the locations were random, so you didn't systematically move out. This randomly picked a location on the wall that you had to throw through. So you're you're repeating the throw to different locations, right? So classic represent repeti repetition without repetition, right? So that's what they're doing in this. Um, they measured accuracy in terms of your mean error, radial error, how far away the ball was from the target, right? Um, not taking direction into account, just looking at it radially. Um, they measured the absolute the amount of learning in terms of the change in your radial error. Did it get smaller, higher? Okay. Um, they looked at the pretest, post test, and retention, right? Um, they they looked they measured. Um, they wanted to look at a relationship. Was there any relationship between the effect of the variability and where you started? So to do this, they used a lag one autocorrelation. Basically, they looked at how consistently did you throw to the same location, right? How, consi how strongly was your current throw related to the throw that just happened before, right? If they're not very consistent, that's a high amount of inherent variability. Every time you're producing a slightly different throw, if they're very related, that means you're very, very consistent. You might be missing the target, but you're, you're, you're consistently throwing the ball, right? So those are the things they're going to look at, right? So that's the basic design of the study. Fairly, as I mentioned, a fairly straightforward study, okay? So here's the results. So the first thing they found was that all three variability groups showed better learning than the control group. So the control group actually got worse um, in performance. Um, all three variability groups did better they they showed improvement right and if they looked at it there was really no significant differences in the learning amount of learning for the three different groups they all showed about the equal amount of improvement from pre to post to retention right uh the low variability group the medium variable group and the high variable group once they did like post hoc test and things like that the one that stood out that did it the best and they looked at effect sizes which you can see in the bottom there the low variability group showed the effect size is the measure of, you know, just not just looking at the change of means, the change of means relative to the variability. The low variability group had the, the highest improvement, right? So really not consistent with their hypothesis, right? They were expecting the medium variability group to have the best improvement. If anything, the low variability group did, whether they're different was, was questionable, right? But that's their basic finding. Uh, low vary group improved from radial error of 11 down to 8, right, in the pretest. Medium vary group, radial error of 11 down to 9.5. High variable group, about 11.8 down to 9.2. So fairly similar uh, results, okay? When they looked at the correlation between your intrinsic variability, measured in terms of that lag one autocorrelation, the only group that showed a significant effect was the low variability group, right? So this seems to suggest that low variability is more beneficial for learning, at least for in this study, as compared to higher and 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 which is you know a lot of people would argue right where is, is what we're seeing. So what they conclude is there's not they can't really find support for this U shape um, because the the medium variability didn't group, uh, do the best. Okay. Um, there was not really differences. So all three groups showed learning, good learning effects. Um, you, the high variability group, you know, did not, wasn't sig super, wasn't significantly worse. So you really can't throw that away. Um, there were uh, relationships between where you started and the, the amount of variability. So there, there's kind of a weak 
um, a, a fact for for here, right? So again, they're they're showing that the amount. So I think the conclusions from there. Before I get to my point, the main conclusions I would take from this is is where I started with, right? the amount of variability you need um, depends on the learner, right? The not everybody can handle a high variability from the start. That doesn't mean you start have to start with plurally blocked constant practice and then move. Right? You can always start with some variability, but then scale it up. Use the challenge point. Use the the seventy five percent rule in terms of success rate. If they're way they're way below that, then reduce the variability. That's what I do. And and you know, um, so I think this study, you know, it doesn't give a clear answer because there's not a clear answer. Right? There's the amount of variability you need is is um, depends on the, the individual, right? There's the amount they start with their skill level. But the biggest point I would make here, this is a, the frustrating thing I find with some of these studies, right? Right, is the pretest, right? The pretest and the post test, right? The reason variability we want you to train with variability in practice, right, is because there's variability in competition, right? That's the whole point of ecological dyna dynamics, right? The idea you need to be able to adapt to constraints, so we need you to train you the ability to adapt to the constraints, right? So if I test you in the condition, train you, test, train you in a condition where we're varying the ball's location, and I test you in the same locations the same every time, I'm really not evaluating ev adaptability at all, right? Um, no, so I'm testing a condition where we don't really need a ton of adaptability, even though we probably promoted it in the variability condition. So in my opinion, this is a not way to good way to test the benefits of variability of practice by testing people in conditions with no variability, right? That seems kind of uh, counterintuitive to me. Um, but Rob, you might say, well, what about sports like pitching a baseball? You're pitching the same distance, right? Or shooting a basketball three throw. Aren't those people doing performing under very low variability conditions. Yes, but there's still variability, right? That, that's the, the whole point of me call it. The constraints are still changing. I have to pitch the ball to different locations. I have to pitch from the first to the ninth inning when I'm fatigued. I have to make a free throw in the first and fourth quarter when I'm fatigued. The constraints are changing, right? Variability of practice helps you learn to adapt to those constraints, right? In this thing, when I'm only testing you for a couple minutes, I'm not getting fatigue effects. So I'm not getting, I'm not, the pre and post test where I'm measuring the learning doesn't require any adaptability, right? So I, as I said, I don't think it's the best test of variability of practice. But I think the overall message that there's not, you know, one ideal amount of variability for everybody is, you know, I think we've accepted that. And that's what this was trying to demonstrate. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for joining me. Cheers for now and keep them coupled.